All right, so uh, now officially, thank you all for being here tonight uh, or today, uh, depending where you're calling in from, um, to the Data Visualization Zurich Meetup. Uh, we have uh, our guest, Stephanie Posevic, who will uh, talk about her work and her process. Um, quick reminder or sort of like an intro to the people who have joined today for the first time. Um, the motivation behind the Data Visualization Zurich Meetup is on one side to sort of like unite the diverse community uh, of people sort of like interested and involved in data visualization in Zurich and beyond. Uh, then the second one is sort of like to give space um, in order so that we can like share and learn from each other. Uh, and the third is that we want to foster relationships um, and collaborations across disciplines, across organizations. Um, that would be our hope. Um, one important change uh, has happened since the last meetup. Um, as we announced uh, last time, uh, our sort of like long time co-organizer, Luc Guillermo, uh, has uh, since moved on uh, and uh, due to his sort of like change of, of place. So he moves from Switzerland uh, to the US. Um, uh, he sort of like decided to take some time off from co-organizing the meetup. And we were looking for co-organizers and luckily we have found two fantastic uh, replacements uh, for Luc. Uh, that's uh, first, Christina Boyata. Uh, she's co-founder and designer and developer at C Creative Labs in Zurich. Uh, and together with Gabriel Lang, who's uh, co-founder uh, and CEO of Frontworks, um, also based in Zurich. Uh, and sort of like the three of us um, will organize the meetups going forward. Um, we will have sort of like uh, a rotating uh, organization role. Um, and so starting uh, July, August and September, you will see uh, their faces uh, as the moderators of our meetups. As always, if you have questions, suggestions, comments, uh, please let us know. Um, definitely meetup.com dash DataVisZurich uh, would be the first place to start, but you can also reach us as DataVisZRH uh, on Twitter and on Instagram. Today's schedule, uh, we'll keep this very short. Uh, I will as soon as possible hand over to Steph uh, so that we can dive into her presentation, uh, which will last roughly 40 minutes. After that, we'll have some time for questions and answers uh, that we sort of like do using the chat and then we uh, have Stephanie answer your questions. Um, and then sort of like in roughly an hour, we're uh, ready to sign off. So, Quick introduction about Stephanie, even though I believe that for most of you, she wouldn't need uh, any introduction, but if I have the chance, I will definitely not miss out on that. Stephanie is a renowned designer, artist, and author, uh, and she explores playful, friendly uh, approaches to communicating data and information to all ages and audiences. Her work has been exhibited at major galleries, including the storefront of art and architecture in New York, the Centre Pompidou in uh, Paris, uh, the Art Science Museum in Singapore, and the Somerset House in London. Uh, and her award-winning collaboration together with Georgia Lupi, Dear Data, uh, is held in the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Arts in New York. Um, it has also since been turned into a book, and dare I say, into a movement of handcrafted data collections. Uh, Stephanie and I met for the first time almost 10 years ago, uh, in 2012 at the C conference in Wiesbaden, where she presented her early work, uh, including uh, Writing Without Words, which has been one of sort of like the uh, capstone projects that put her onto the scene. And since then, Steph went on to create human scaled, handcrafted, tangible, wearable, and even danceable data experience all over the world. Uh, and we're extremely honored and happy to have her. And with that, I will hand over to you, Steph. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And uh, feel free to share your presentation. OK, I will do that now. Um, oh, yeah, thanks for that introduction. I can't believe it's been, yeah, it's been like 10 years. And you, you touched upon some, some old classic projects. <laughs> I feel like a very long time ago, so that was great. Um, all right, so I'll just share my screen. Right, you should see my bright red Apple screen, I hope. And then 
tell me if you don't see hello. Do you see a hello? We are we there. See hello. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Excellent. Um, hi, everybody. Um, that's how I start my presentation. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I mean, Ben's given me an introduction. <laughs> I'm going to introduce myself a little bit again. So, yeah, I'm Stephanie. I am currently mainly working on experimental data design projects. At least that's what I'm calling them. Um, examples of which include things like this commission for the Royal Papworth Hospital in Cambridge in the UK, where I visualized anonymized heart and lung data gathered from patients and staff, not for any medical insight, but um, I'm just too many screens. There we go. Um, instead to create a unique artwork for each of almost 200 patients rooms in order to create natural patterns of waves, branching and flows that are found both in the heart and lungs as well as in nature. Um, or it could be like a piece from a few years ago, for the Memory Palace exhibition at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, where alongside 19 other designers, I illustrated a section of a story by the writer Harry Kunzru, where by mixing the processes of data gathering and visualization with traditional illustration, I created a triptych of prints that um, illustrated Kunzru's story of a world pre, during and post apocalypse, where the aesthetic for this set of illustrations was created through a process of both gathering and visualizing data relevant to key themes of the story. So as you can see, I, I work with data in a way that's quite different to traditional data visualizations and information graphics. And the best way I found at the moment to describe what I do is I say I'm a designer whose favorite creative material above all others is data. So instead of using photography, pencil or video, to communicate about or respond to a subject, data is the material that I choose to work with. And when I use this material, I aim to communicate messages that go beyond just data insights, where my end intention is to create work or communicate a message that is often more emotive or subjective than what you would find in a traditional chart or data viz. Um, another thing about me as well is, as, <laughs> as was discussed, um, I don't really code much. I often, I will collaborate with developers to help automate various processes and I can kind of like noodle around in processing if someone sets it up for me, but that's about it. But really um, this is because very early on in my practice, I analyzed and gathered data by hand and this early constraint further influenced me to often work with data in a very handmade way. And so you'll see this influence um, through some of the projects I'll be touching upon today. Um, so, like I did at the beginning, I think I said I was a designer and an artist, though, to be honest, I'm not really sure. And I tend to go back and forth. It depends on the project. But I think that I'm probably more of a designer, um, just one that likes to focus on weird projects. Um, and I think the reason for this is that um, when reflecting on my recent residencies and commissions, um, I've realized that the majority of my projects are created to serve a very particular type of audience or community or a very particular client that I serve that will generally fall into one of the following groups. Um, so I'll just list these for you. Um, firstly, newcomers to data of all ages from age four to age 100 who barely know about data at all. Um, the other audience I'm always speaking to are people who don't care about data, who think it's boring or not worth their time. I want to change their mind. And um, finally, uh, people who are intimidated by data, you know, data feels like something far removed from their lives hidden away in a big blue server like this photo of a Google data center. And then lastly, um, in a lot of my work, I'm often speaking to um, communities that aren't very art or design focused where I'm not preaching to the choir, but I'm trying to find a new way of presenting data in a way that best serves that audience where in order to connect and communicate them, I have to move beyond kind of more standard forms of data into something a little bit warmer and a little bit more personal. So with this way of thinking, my goal when working with data is to serve this audience, either real or imagined in my mind, in a new way through extending the visual languages designers use to work with data and experiment with data communication in the same way um, that a communication, well, in the same way a communication designer might normally push the limits of typography, layouts, illustrations, and more. And so through this, um, this kind of exploration, 
I want to explore ways of presenting data that besides being legible are more memorable and expressive to a lay person audience who might just be learning about data for the first time. So that can be making data, um, as mentioned, danceable, like this project as the first data artist in residence at Facebook. I converted a month of a couple's interactions on Facebook timelines into dance steps, bringing their digital dance across timelines into a physical space where I was aiming to serve the Facebook employee community by making the constant journey between meetings and buildings more enjoyable by giving them a chance to dance across campus. Or it can mean making data hoppable, like my open data playground for the South Bank Center in London, where hopscotch games were created from open data sets in order to communicate how these open data sets are online for anyone to interpret and play with however they choose. Where, again, I'm trying to create work to serve a diverse all ages community of people passing by, trying to appeal to both small children who need a place to jump around to adults and parents who are standing by um, telling them this deeper message about open data. Or it could also mean um, a project that's touchable and wearable like this art commission I created with Miriam Quick, where we explored physical ways of communicating open air quality data from Sheffield in a memorable experiential way for a citizen audience who might not be interested in air quality or data in general. So one part of the project presented weeks of particulate matter as data as something you could touch and wear. And the other part communicated a day of pollution levels in Sheffield through glasses that would make your vision more or less polluted and hazy depending on the data. And finally, you know, serving a specific community can mean commemorating their data collection through a, mur a mural as seen in this piece at the Olympic, well, it was up at the Olympic Park in East London, which was made using slightly chaotic data school children collected from the park, um, not for statistical insight, but to inform the design of this new data-driven park landscape where, you know, it serves, it's a design that serves this group of 10 to 11 year old school children where I wanted to make something from their data that was respectful of their contribution and would be playful, bright and appealing to them. So. You know, that's a quick run through these earlier commissions or, you know, looking back in it, I realize I'm focusing on serving the needs of this very specific, very broad kind of newcomer audience that I outlined. At the same time as these community and public focus commissions, I was focusing on this small scale personal project with Georgia Luffy, which I will just quickly skim through <laughs> just for anyone who, don't, you know, this, um, yeah, if you don't know, know about this. Um, so it was our project year data, which was this year of sending each other hand-drawn data postcards back and forth across the Atlantic, where every week for a year, we would collect our personal data around a shared topic um, to investigate parts of ourselves and our days to then reveal to the other. And then we would analyze the data at the end of the week, draw our visualizations on a postcard and pop a stamp on it and post our postcards and then wait with our fingers crossed. And then if all went well, the postcard would arrive um, at the other person's address. And then we would sit with the, uh, the postcard and learn more about the other person's life. And so we did this for a year. And um, you know, here's some examples of mine seen on screen. Um, and Ben mentioned, you know, if you wanna know more, um, there is a book of the project. And then the, we also made this journal, um, this visual journal that most ages and abilities can use to document their lives through gathering and drawing their own data. So, you know, you just sort of lay out how you can do what we did in the postcard project on your own. And then also, as was mentioned, um, the original collection was acquired um, by MoMA in 2016. And the nicest thing of all is that it's finally on display. Well, a selection of cards in their new gallery rehang for the next year and a half. Um, if you're based in New York. <laughs> I hope to see it in person at some point. Um, and probably, however, if we're talking about, um, Ben very kindly called it a movement, but I think this is the thing that is really exciting about the project is that this really manual domestic way of introducing people to data resonated with them. You know, they, there's people from, of all ages, you know, um, people starting the correspondence projects of their own, are using it as part of their teaching materials from primary school to university and beyond to help students learn to collect and present data. Um, and so this really wide audience connected with this project in a way we never anticipated. And we think it's because we um, found this small scale we were working on really opened the idea of data to a wider audience and made it more approachable. I think that's why 
it attracted people because it looked at domestic and often mundane data that most people could relate to. And so through this, um, we've been able to show that data is something that's simply in every aspect of our lives. And it doesn't have to be always, well, always, sometimes it's scary. It doesn't always have to be scary or intimidating. And then also it's just really accessible because, you know, when you're gathering data and analyzing it and, and visualizing it, you don't need fancy um, programs or incredible data analysis skills to begin. All you really need is a pencil to start in, the, in a piece of paper and that's it. And so this project really um, made me, well, made us believe that in order for all, you know, everyone to become more data literate as a population and make more people interested in data in, in general, we really just do need to start by making people how to um, understand how to personally relate to data. I mean, this year, past year and a half, more than ever, you know, we've been confronted with just a sea of numbers, a sea of data to get our head around um, just because of the pandemic. So it can be really overwhelming, but by, by starting small on a human scale, you know, really looking at even at your interests and your life, you can help people learn to see the world with the eyes of a data collector and helping them better navigate this data filled world we live in. So um, what I'll do for the rest of the talk is um, just share three projects I've done recently that are very all ages um, and uh, just uh, show how this small approach I, like that we championed with gear data really fed into my more recent projects because it has had a really big impact. And so I'll share these now. Um, and I'll just start with um, just uh, one small thing that I, I guess we learned from the Dear Data project. Um, one of the biggest takeaways, um, and this has really informed my practice, is that it was our realization that the data that Georgia and I sent to each other was always the starting point for deeper conversation. It was never the end point. It was this, you know, we begin to ask each other about our postcards and that's really how we learned about each other. And so I, um, I've extended the mind, this mindset in my personal practice um, where in my work, I've been using data collection and visualization to start conversations with the community, where I found that respectful data collection reminds the community they're important and valued, and where by using this data to create an artwork, I feel I'm immortalizing and commemorating their unique patterns and perceptions. And I started refining this approach a couple of years ago when I was the artist in residence at the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich, London. Uh, exploring, I was specifically brought in uh, to um, like use data as a way to listen and, resp and respond to visitors with the intention of making the museum more participatory, I can't say that word, participatory, engaging and memorable. And as part of this residency, I collaborated with my friend, the data journalist, Miriam Quick, who comes up a lot. She's a constant collaborator. Um, so um, you'll hear her name often. Uh, but uh, while settling into my residency, um, I became fascinated by the collection of Royal Navy ships badges that were on the gallery walls around my studio door. And so these are often witty and playful in their imagery and Royal Navy ships badges function as the visual identity of a ship akin to a traditional coat of arms. And while I sat at a cafe pre-pandemic and observed the museum visitors, I began to see them as a fleet of ships where each visitor's ship brought their unique personality and view of, their, of the world as their car going to the museum. And therefore, it made sense that each visitor ship should be commemorated with their own ship's badge, but one that's made from their personal data. So uh, first in the process, Miriam and I collected data aiming to create an experience that would appeal to visitors of all ages and also be respectful and thankful of their data contribution. Miriam created surveys appropriate for children and adults that collected a mis mixture of basic demographic data as well as questions adapted from the Big Five personality test. And to end the survey, we also asked respondents what single word they'd use to describe themselves. So the, um, the data collection was done over five days and on this map, like next to this big map, pre-pandemic, all the kids could run around on. So we attracted lots of visitors and school children who were just kind of um, sitting in the cafe and kind of um, relaxing there. And so we would set up a stall at the side where we invited people to take our survey and learn what shift they would be based on their personality. So the survey took a few minutes to fill out and then when completed, 
We would use the lo-fi decoding tool on the left to assess their survey responses, determine what ship they would be, and then we give them a giant literal ship's badge sticker I designed of that ship. And next we gave participants further context through displaying a tally board showing how many of each ship type type took the survey. Color indicated where the survey taker was from. Like remember when you could travel across borders. Wow, what a, <laughs> those teddy days. One day <laughs> we'll have it again, I hope. Um, and so here's the final count on the last day. And this is, uh, we ended up with 600 survey responses. So lots of material to create an artwork with. And so one thing that I really liked about this process, and I'll talk about it a little bit more in another project, is how this data collection experience offered these multiple points for the museum visitors' self-reflection and discovery and ultimately talking points where some people who took the survey found it was interesting to reflect upon their answers to the survey. And some were amused or excited about the ship they were, and some weren't. Like there's like lots of children that were headed up as lifeboats when they really wanted to be um, like, uh, yeah, aircraft carriers, you know, things like that. They, they, they were crossed with, with, um, yeah, with the results. Um, to those who were interested in seeing how the results compared with others, the tally chart. So it offered these different openings for all sorts of people to start learning about themselves and about the museum. Now, we had all this data and Miriam analyzed it. It showed nothing out of the ordinary compared to more rigorous personality research and studies. And so in the end, the most evocative part of the survey was this one word visitors used to describe themselves. So we used this as the main mode of organizing our data. And then with the data in hand, I needed to create an artwork that spoke to the audience I collected data from. So children, parents, and newcomers to data. So I decided to move away from abstracted data as it didn't feel right for this all ages audience and instead moved towards a more playful approach. And so I took like the chips badges as my main visual reference and I ramped it up a bit using these bold graphic elements and playful animals and witty names found on the chips badges as my inspiration. And so I made these first sketches and I decided that uh, demographic data would inform the external frame of the badge. And then the internal watery scene would be created from a visitor's personality scores. So, I have a random stray slide in here and I don't know why it's there. So I'll just skip through it. <laughs> Oops. Um, so uh, the final system for turning this data into ship's badges is as follows. So each word used by visitors to describe themselves is represented as a badge. The crown on each badge represents the gender breakdown of who chose that word. And the rope represents the proportion of children to adults who chose that word. And for the main section of the badge, each has an animal on it that represents the average agreeableness score for that word, ranging from a lion representing more competitive and defensive personalities all the way through to the other extreme of being kind, helpful, and trusting, so represented by a dog. And then the next, the average extroversion score for the word is represented by the object the animal is holding. Uh, where shields and palms obscur obscuring the face represent more introversion and animals flying their flags and, and blowing their own horns represent higher extroversion scores. And, and all of these objects are actually found on Royal Navy ships badges or have been in the past. And next, what the animal is sitting in or standing in represents the average openness score for that word, where um, the closer to the water, the more open and unconventional they are, ranging um, from like a pool ring for the less conventional all the way to a fortress or a castle for those who are more conventional, um, more traditional. And then weather around the animal represents neuroticism for the word. So sunshine, you know, people who are stable and calm, uh, the stormy weather representing those who are often worried or easily upset. And then there's more, you know, encoded in that image where the water represents the conscientiousness score for the word ranging from calm smooth seas, so tidy, organized personalities to a tidal wave for people who embrace chaos. So you can see with all of these design decisions, there's still this intent to the design to the meaning of the data, however playful it may be. So this is what the final badges look like, um, each representing the aggregated responses for each word um, that people use to describe themselves, where every single one of the 177 created badges are unique. So this is just a selection of a few of these. Um, and there's a few more. Oh, 
And here's uh, the final piece on the wall. So this work offered a space for visitors of all ages to enjoy this artwork in different ways. I mean, it was like right by the buggy park anyway. So it's mainly young children, as you know, where like all the kids drop their buggies off before they explore the museum. So um, as a young child can enjoy the animals and their like the pictures to an older audience, enjoying reading the words selected by the visitors and using the legend to decode the data to the data or personality test enthusiasts, of which there were a few that came through, who were looking at that higher, deeper level. So it functioned on multiple levels for multiple audiences. Um, okay, so just um, on, on to project number two, I've got two left. Um, so this interest in collecting um, data from communities in order to celebrate them, is also fed, you know, this sort of format has um, fed into my more recent project that's out this summer um, called Updating Happiness. So this bit, like I haven't really spoken about it publicly, so forgive the clumsiness. I'm still kind of, it's still in progress. So I'm still working out how I'm talking about it. Um, so this is a work that was commissioned by the Welcome Collection this summer. Well, as part of their unhappiness season of events, it was meant to be last summer, but it's this summer due to reasons we all know. Um, for those of you who aren't, haven't ever, you know, who aren't London based, uh, the Welcome Collection is really one of my favorite museums here. Um, they describe themselves as, quote, a free museum and library exploring health and human experience. But what's really special about this collection is that they explore health and human experience, not just through science or scientific exhibitions exhibits, but also through commissioning artists, both for the gallery and across the UK, you know, they um, fund a lot of research projects and creative projects. I mean, I'm funded by them separately on another project now. Um, and they just like offer this chance for artists to respond to various topics. And so it's really always been a dream of mine to be one of these artists in this gallery. So it's really exciting. Um, and I was, you know, at the beginning of this project, say a couple of years ago, or oh, more than that, I was originally brought on board to create a work using data that functioned as some sort of emotional check-in for the visitors to the exhibition that would give this happiness exhibition, that would give them an opportunity to think about their own perceptions of happiness and, and whether they were truly happy. And the piece needed to work for ages 14 and up, so that's the main age range that visit the museum, but it also still needed to be suitable for younger audiences as well. And finally, um, of course, uh, this project needed to be as accessible as possible, um, both digitally and in person in the gallery. So when I started to think about how to fulfill this brief, I started my research on happiness as well as the aesthetic of happiness. And visually, I became drawn to happiness or inspirational posters. Now, posters showing positive platitudes and upbeat motivational quotes and have been around for decades, but now they've uh, moved from hanging on people's walls or in their offices to being posted on Instagram where they number in their millions. And, you know, these positive Instagram platitudes and quotes, they all have a particular aesthetic um, with like, the, the ones for women have a, like a women aesthetic of like pink backgrounds and people reaching up to the sky, beaches, um, sunsets, you know, uh, they have a particular look. Um, now for me, I don't really like these. They, I don't like the quotes. I, I think they feel very superficial and not very meaningful. Like there's one in the bottom um, bottom right that just has like a beach and says happiness is life. Well, I mean, I, I guess that's true, but like, you know, give me a bit more than that. You know, they don't really explore what actually makes us happy. And they don't paint a diverse picture of happiness. And I also feel like they are put up on Instagram to serve this idea of toxic positivity, where many of these happiness quotes are posted to celebrate positive thinking as a way of solving problems. So, you know, where you're only allowed to think positively, and this ultimately will just erase or suppress people's negative feelings through positive positivity, which, you know, with this mindset, a person is blamed for having negative thoughts, which to me seems unfair, you know, especially after last year, right? And then finally, as part of my research, I was also reading about negative effects of social media, you know, chiming a lot with my own experience of Instagram, you know, I don't really, I'm on it, but I don't know how I feel about it. And, um, you know, I, I think I suffer from it, you know, like it doesn't everyone, but it, you know, when you, it makes you worry about yourself when you see everyone's like depictions of their successful life. So, um, so this is rolling around my head. And so I decided that, okay, this is the type of project I'd make, um, you know, where I wanted to figure out 
how to make a better version of these, how to subvert these Instagram quotes that really annoyed me so much whenever I looked at them. So this is how I did it, um, or I think I did, you can let me know. Um, I uh, in, created a work where to start um, participants. See, I like surveys. I feel like that they're useful. Um, they're invited to take a, a two minute survey, either online or on their phones in the gallery to make it COVID proof. Um, the survey will ask you your age along with four questions adapted from the UK's Office for National Statistics for measuring personal well-being. Oops. Can you answer let me know whether you can hear me? Can you hear me? I just lost power on these. Um, is everything good? Yes, you're good. Steph, you're good. So, can you hear me? Sorry. Plan one. Someone let me know if you can hear my voice, please. Yes. I, you know what? AirPods Pro. They make little like noises in my ears and I have no idea what they mean. So they're new, they're new. So I'm just gonna like go like this and we'll see what we can do. <laughs> um, right, okay. Uh, so Office for National Statistics in the UK, they have four measures of personal well-being that they ask the nation to get a sense of how happy we are. Um, yeah, it's probably a bit tinny, Jeremy, because I think I lost, I lost my power so it's going through my computer. So I'm, apologies for that. Um, uh, yeah, so these, these are the four measures they use to get a sense of the, the country's well-being, um, where, um, and they're similar for other countries, like the OECD has similar ones that they offer as guidance um, for, um, as well. So where they, these are the four questions. So how satisfied are you with your life nowadays? To what extent do you feel that the things you do in your life are worthwhile? Um, then how happy did you feel yesterday? And then how anxious did you feel yesterday? And then next, this is not part of the Office for National Statistics. This is me. Um, the uh, user can choose one of four questions to answer their perception of happiness. So, you know, what's one small thing from today you're most grateful for? What guilty pleasure, like, you know, makes you happy, but you're too embarrassed to tell anyone about? If happiness was an experience, what would it be? Or what single thing makes you feel better after a bad day? And so these were specifically uh, created to elicit kind of a more nuanced and varied depiction of happiness. So once someone fills it out, they press enter and they instantly receive a quote based on their responses so that you can then add to a growing collective archive of reflections on happiness. And this is a guilty pleasure that someone submitted to the project on screen. And participants also have the option to download and post on their own social media feeds, thus populating the internet with more nuanced ideas of happiness. And so also they can, if they want, they can, so yeah, they can add their quote to the artwork where it will be displayed online. And it will also be displayed in various places in the gallery through projection or printed on wallpaper or displayed on the gallery's external facade. So that's um, really exciting. So. Um, as for the general aesthetic, it's very, very, very bright. So um, the, 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 um, I, I kept calling it rave tapestry aesthetic throughout like the whole process. So um, I really wanted it to be uh, different than the usual aesthetic of these quotes where it's really in your face, bright RGB colors and really joyful as opposed to pink and insipid. So here are some early iterations where I was trying lots of wild approaches. Um, and then this is like, what I ended up with, which is what you see, this is the set of generative rules behind every quote, where every single question that they answer directly informs a part of this design. Where again, like the Maritime Museum, this data collection experience process offers these multiple points for someone to both look inside themselves, discover something new about themselves, and then see how they relate to everyone else around them. And so here are examples of some that people have created um, so far. So, um, you know, yeah, go to the link in the chat to try it out for yourself. So the in-person exhibition of this work will be up from mid-July for those of you who are in London. Um, so yeah, so um, that's happening right now and being installed next week, which is cool. Um, but now into one final project um, and then I'll wrap up. Um, so thinking, you know, about how like Dear Data has informed my practice and kind of wanting to reach a big audience. Um, you know, I think it was, obviously it was really accessible. 
and you know we've got a great response but how can we take it further because after all many people might not pick up a book with data in the title um you know it, it might instantly put people off even if there's all these hand-drawn things around it so how do you make a data book that really reaches the data uninitiated or data intimidated so I've explored this challenge in the recent book I have out with my friend Miriam again, because we always work together. I am a book, I am a portal to universe. And so this is published, it's, it's, it's around, it's published by Penguin in the UK and the US and it's in Australia and New Zealand and some European countries. So it's, I'm not sure where it is, it's, it's findable. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so um, that's like such a bad like sales pitch. I should say that in a more bold way, shouldn't I? Um, but anyway, so about this book, um, it started in a meeting in a cafe with Miriam uh, in 2018 uh, when we were both feeling a little bit bored. Um, we felt like we were um, suffering like within our data, data viz kind of career. We felt like we were suffering from chart fatigue where we didn't really feel like we were doing anything new with how we worked with data and we were stuck in a rut. And so we were trying to come up with ideas together. And our chart fatigue meant we also grew weary of uh, formats like the infographic book. So this is, was an innovative format a decade ago that completely transformed the data design landscape. And it's one we've both worked on in the past, but it's long since been superseded seated by online graphics. But um, we still love books. You know, my background is actually um, in publishing, so I still occasionally design books um, now um, for other people now. Um, but we asked ourselves, so how can we make something different than the standard info book, and what would that mean in practice? So with all of this in mind, we began to brainstorm new ideas for collaboration uh, while um, dancing my baby to sleep in a cafe, and we came up with our super book idea. Um, what if we made a book where the self is the measuring device? So we began to develop the general concept. Um, the book itself is a measuring device that can be used to measuring measure things. Our working title was the measuring book, which is a lot easier to say than the current title. Um, and it's a book for almost everyone, for children age eight and up to adults. And our goal was to write for the data uninitiated or data intimidated. So people who wouldn't normally pick up a book with data or science in the title. So we wanted the book to be accessible enough for children, but entertaining enough for adults with a bit of bite and humor to it. And finally, our golden rule and biggest constraint, all the data should be represented on a one-to-one -one scale printed on the page actual size. Um, so, um, Miriam shaped the, the research and the narrative of the book and um, together we worked on the tone of voice where um, we realized that the book should speak directly to the reader in the first person and have a strong personality so fun, playful and a little arrogant. And uh, Miriam shaped the research um, in the narrative where to so that the, the book tells you stories about a universe that's dynamic, constantly moving and changing, full of millions or billions of living organisms and countless mysterious elusive things flying through us or away from us. Um, like the spread, which estimates, again, all Miriam's calculations, <laughs> based on the book's volume, there are probably about 187,000 relic neutrinos passing through it at any one time. And relic neutrinos are subatomic particles left over from the first moments after the Big Bang. Bang. So by being a measuring device, the book is like a portal to the world where around you, where you can see things that were previously invisible. Um, so it's a scientific book, but also a story for both children and adults. Um, like in this spread, the book flies to the moon and it gathers a blanket of moon dust as thick as one of its own pages, um, where in reality, this would take 200 years to achieve. Um, but then there's magic on this spread because we're, we've got a talking book flying to the moon. And um, so we settled for a balance between fact and fantasy. We decided to call data-driven magic realism, where Miriam made sure that all the numbers are as accurate as possible and based on peer-reviewed research where possible, um, but mixed with flights of fantasy and playfulness. Where the playfulness was again underpinned through ensuring everything was fully referenced. This is the small print, a big appendix at the back of the book written by Miriam, where she explains all the background calculations and assumptions behind each spread. Um, but okay, so that's the data, but how do we visualize it? 
Um, well, we made it so it's not like any um, data informed book that you hopefully have ever seen before. So it's a book with no charts, no infographics, where instead this book only communicates its data using its bookie superpowers. So it's ink, typeface, page size, thickness, volume, weight, um, and more. Uh, so we might use the double O's within relevant words to represent to scale the actual size of various animals' eyes in a spread. Or you might have to drop the book from waist height to understand how fast it moves through the air. Or slam it shut as hard as you can to hear how noisy sunshine would actually sound if um, space was in a vacuum. Or find out exactly how many stars are born and exploded during the time it takes to turn a page. So this is not an ebook and never will be you know, not the, not the best book to release in a pandemic, one that um, is physical that people touch, but hey. Um, where we explicitly challenge ourselves to make a data book using, without using the, the word data anywhere in the book, except for our bios where it couldn't be helped. Um, so it took us two and a half years. Did we actually succeed in making like a book that went beyond the usual info book? Well, I mean, we think we have. Um, it's been a tough year for books uh, like ours though, but we're pretty proud. Um, you know, it was, uh, the FT named it one of its best books of 2020, which is great given that um, bookshops in the UK have been shut for half the time that the book's been out. So not been easy, so that's great. Um, so yeah, you can find more online about the book if you wanna know more um, and have a chat with it. It likes to talk back um, when we're, yeah, every once in a while these days. <laughs> So uh, yeah, so um, that's just a, a showcase of a few recent projects and just to, just to sum it up, some of my key findings from using um, the approach, the personal playful small data approach um, in my practice, I kind of um, really got stuck into with your data. Um, first, um, I have really found success in using data collection as an interface for engaging and responding to a wider community. You know, I really think it functions as a, this icebreaker to um, offer deeper reflection in the people that engage with it in deeper conversations. Um, also, since the positive response to the Dear Data project, I found that these sorts of emotive and play playful data projects captivate a wider audience and one might attract if the end result was abstract, cold, and algorithmic. And uh, finally, I really, uh, you know, believe in the value of more embodied experiential approaches to representing data um, when present, you know, creating, presenting it for a wider, wider audience where a reader experiences data directly in front of them on their scale. And I really think that further exploration of this approach is really vital to moving the data design space forward. And just to finally sum up with this slide that I always sum up with, but, um, you know, I think working with data, it's just really made me believe more than ever that we don't just have to collect and visualize data for statistical insight, but it's this in-between material, in-between many disciplines where, you know, a data set can be a scientific and analytical material that data scientists and data journalists work with, or a cultural artifact that artists might respond to, or the souvenir of an experience as documented through data, like the Dear Data Project, or even an interface for engaging with the community where, you know, every way of working with data will um, be completely different in these different spaces. But I think all of these approaches to working with data help move um, our perceptions of data and, and data viz forward. Um, so that's it, thanks. Okay. All right, um, I've lost all power in these, so I'm just gonna take this out. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, uh, Stephanie, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, fantastic insight into such a sort of like broad variety of, of pieces. Um, we, we do have sort of like one or two questions. Uh, the first is not a question, but a statement, uh, but I will sort of like transform it into a question. That's the benefit of moderating a Q&A instead of having it at a conference. Um, so uh, Christian mentions that sort of like his mind is blown by sort of like your creative ability to turn emotions or emotionality into visual outputs. Um, and so what I would love to hear, maybe you talk a little bit because you're, 
your output is distinct. Like I believe personally, it's recognizable that you have been behind some of the some of that work. Yet the aesthetic changes dramatically. It's not sort of like a very sort of like clearly assignable style in terms of sort of like visual aesthetics. Um, so I would I would love if you would give us a little glimpse into how do you come up with sort of like what aesthetic fits uh, the rave sort of like color scheme um, <laughs> of updating happiness versus like the, the more illustrated, beautiful sort of like um, comic-like illustrations for the Maritime uh, Museum. Like how do you find where, where the right place is? Um, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's a really good question because it's something that I think about a lot and, you know, um, you know, I've never like talked about it in any kind of talk or, or, or public space. Um, I think it's because I do see myself as, uh, I come from a communication design background and so I, I don't, like, I don't think I'm an illustrator that has a style you know, that are not style, maybe that comes off as negative. They have this approach and people go to them because they want something that looks like how they draw or how they make image. Um, but instead I, I see myself more as a designer where the, the aesthetic will change depending on the project and what's right for the data and what's right for the audience. Um, and so I think that's why it shifts all the time. You know, like the, the National Maritime Museum one, I mean, they do, they have some, like I, there, there was an artist that was coming in after me that is this like incredible and does like really cool work <laughs> that I was really intimidated by, um, you know, and I really wish I was one of these people that could just like make really beautiful work that like people stand around. But I just felt like for that project to turn something from children and the visitors, and it really was mostly kids and families and lots of little kids who wanted to get stickers, like to turn that into something. It was really, it is about the audience, just to, to like erase all that and to turn it into something that was like beautifully hand drawn, like the Dear Data Project, which might look really beautiful, but then like completely erase the fact that like, there are all these like, there are all these kids that like really wanted to do it and they dragged all their, their um, parents over and all of their friends over and they were just they basically were doing our outreach for us um, you know like I think it was really important to kind of commemorate them so I think it really is about audience which is why maybe I say I'm a designer and the last thing about that I'll just say is yeah I mean like the fact that it changes is something that I wrestle with because I don't <laughs> But then there's this, I don't know, there's, there's an, a UK artist, um, Jeremy Deller, um, who I really like. And I feel like, I, I find him really inspiring because he's an artist whose uh, a, aesthetic approach changes. Like it feels like it changes with every project or like every commission that he does. And so it's nice to know there's people like that out there who are doing um, weird art things, but they don't all look the same. Um, yeah. I don't know, that's, that's my like, you just got like all of my internal, uh, you know, gears worrying around. Like, what am I doing with with my, with what I'm doing? It's all out there now. <laughs> good, good. Um, let me uh, jump sort of like to I guess like a shorter question. Uh, any plans on translating the book? I am a book. Um, well, it, that would be great. <laughs> um, it's not really like it is. If anyone knows any publishers, um, it's all set up in a typeface that is, it's all prepared to be translated in many ways. So it's just, it's not really down to us. So Penguin UK, it, it's like, a, it's, it's like publishing. So they, um, you know, they kind of own the rights, the world rights, and then they'll sell it into different regions. So we've had some conversation about translating it in different languages. Um, and I think one has gone through, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, it seems to be a very slow process. So, you, you so yeah, so it is available to be translated if somebody like wanted to, it is very, it's already, it's all the files, are, files are all set up. So you, you just didn't make yourself, you didn't set yourself up to have an easy translation as in like, you know, body text basically translated it seems like you would have to basically touch every individual uh, yeah, illustration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got you just got to type it all in on, on in in InDesign, and there's a couple that you would need um, my gui guidance. I think 
we it, it's a it's definitely a challenging book because you really we've had this conversation with a uh, um a publisher who i think in another country who's going to translate it but you know because it's all dependent on the book's weight um it needs like we the it's published um using a paper stock that is uh commonly available <laughs> so that way people can easily uh get it or find something comparable um but then it's important that they keep like the size of the book and like the finish of the book the same so it's roughly the same size because it is all dependent on weight and um so yeah it's I don't know. I, I, <laughs> I, I'm really proud of the book and there's nothing like it, but it's, it's definitely not like, you know, it's, uh, it's been like engineered to the nines and, um, <laughs> fantastic. Yeah. It's probably not the easiest sell. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Which makes it special. Um, yeah. and so, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Let me go into this might be a slightly deeper question. Um, I will read it to be accurate to what they what they wrote. Um, how can DataVis creators take an equitable and non-extractive approach when getting information from marginalized and underrepresented communities? Um, well, okay, so I would just say that I wouldn't feel like I would be able to give like, a, you know, I don't think that that type of research is the sort that I have ever done personally. But what I think is important is, I think it's about, be, well, I mean, I, I guess it's important to be respectful and transparent if you're taking data from them or to not taking data, that sounds, but like if you're asking people to, to give their time to um, fill out a survey and, um, uh, ult yeah, ultimately give you some data to work with, whether it's for research or it's for um, like a artwork in a gallery or in a, in a museum, I think that you first need to um, say what you're gonna do and not do with it. So like not use it for anything, you know, usual data protection, um, don't use it for anything except for what you, you said you're gonna use it for. And then I think, what I really liked about these projects is that it gives the, um, it kind of gives a payoff to the people that take part, like they get something personally unique out of it. So they kind of get a reward for their time, even if it's just a, like a sticker and, and kind of they're told what type of ship they are. So, you know, it doesn't feel like I'm exploiting them for my own artistic gain, but like ensuring that I have created this experience that will offer meaning to them. So I'm not sure how like that, you know, I don't have experience with kind of um, more rigorous research uh, for marginalized communities, but I feel like a lot of that probably translates like respect, transparency and creating like a really open and welcoming experience is probably part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. That sounds, that sounds great. Um, let me see. Uh, ha, you might have touched on this before when I asked you about sort of like your creative process, um, but Aida asks, um, what's your source of inspiration uh, as all your projects are so amazingly creative? Um, inspiration, what is my inspiration? You know what, I, I, <laughs> um, I think, I think I'm, I, I, I like to have a brief, so, um, I think as long as I have a brief, I'll be fine. You know, every project that I've done, I've had a, there, it's not like they've all been created like for a specific reason. Um, it's only dear data that wasn't, um, you know, that was just kind of pulled out of thin air. So I think I'm still a designer, you know, I'm given a brief and then I like to be as creative as possible. But otherwise, I guess when it comes to like personal inspiration, I'm interested in, um, <laughs> rules and uh numbers and notation and patterns and um textile design or things that are outside of data visualization um i hope to find more inspiration in um but that's a really 
but even then I mean it does make me realize that you know when you're stuck at home for a year like how you know I haven't been kind of confronted with inspiration as much as I used to be like oh I don't know I'm sure other people feel the same way but you realize that you're not you're not like you're just seeing the four walls of your house all the time so so not inspirational quotes on Instagram is what you're saying no <laughs> yeah um all right yeah I'm sure some are good <laughs> some are good there's a lot that aren't though all right um Brenda asks a question about sort of like how maybe your type or your style of data visualization sort of like would translate into an organizational setting. And I assume that means into a more sort of like institutional or corporate setting. Um, do you have experience in sort of like how, how this has been sort of like asked by maybe more institutional clients uh, to bring in this type of- uh... that's, a, that's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I think that um, I suppose that the way that it would be translated in the institution would just be in more like, you know, obviously um, more subtle ways, maybe um, where you're thinking about like data, like this idea of like this data experience um, and ensuring, you know, what we were just talking about, like taking some of the key themes from it and then and then applying it in a more practical way, like you know, respectful data collection, transparent, and creating this nice experience to, you know, finding subtle, um, like nods to kind of like data embodiment or just, you know, like using, um, I don't know, more custom data visualization. Um, I'm, you know, I, I don't know, that's probably not a really good answer. I don't have a good answer. I, um, I think, I think what's important though is that it's just a reminder that data can be encoded with anything or can be encoded into anything. That's basically all that I feel like big organizations need to know. You know, you can turn data into anything. And if you're an ad agency or you're, um, you know, data can be represented by all sorts of materials, by movements, by sounds, by taste, by smell. And so really like the options are limitless. So I guess that's really what I'm trying to do is speak more to communication designers or creatives who might just think, oh, data is something I don't understand because I work in advertising, I don't really care. It's just to realize that like, actually it's just really flexible material and you can do lots of cool things with it. Excellent. So Thank you. I guess that's why, that's what I'm trying to say to a big, a big great. company or yeah. big creative company. Yeah, that's a great statement. Uh, let me sort of like ask you sort of like the last question and then we will have to sort of like uh, wrap yeah. it up for today. Um, interesting question for sure, uh, an important question for sure. I'm really curious about your answer on it. Um, what are some practices that we can use to make data viz more accessible? Uh, and I assume accessible as in sort of like lowering the barrier for understanding uh, information. Um, mm -hmm. Like they give examples like uh, using labels instead of relying on color. So I'm, I'm curious if accessibility, like especially for projects that are on the web, we understand sort of like web content accessibility. Are these concerns for projects where it's maybe more in public space um, on murals, on hospital walls uh, is accessibility a concern there and how do you sort of like work with it um yeah i think i think accessible well i mean it will it, it'll all depend on the it'll all depend on the project and what i found is that it's become more of a concern recently which i think is great right like that means that things are like changing and um i definitely feel like, yeah, yeah, I, I think there's a, def a definite shift. Um, but I don't, I think that the accessibility concerns are, have all, I mean, they're, they're as standard as they are for other, um, I guess other forms of communication design, you know, like anything in, in a gallery, like I need to have a certain point size. Um, <laughs> and then also, like not just accessibility, but also inclusiveness for both um, the National Maritime Museum and for um, 
and for uh, the Welcome Collection. And the Welcome Collection has been really like they, this is something that's a huge deal for them is making all of, you know, making all of their galleries as like kind of inclusive and as accessible as possible. So it's been like a constant point of conversation where um, at least uh, for updating happiness, um, the project at various points was um, uh, sent out to various groups, um, whether it was, um, I guess maybe I think uh, like more neurodiverge. Like some of the questions were sent out to um, groups that offered insight, like from more neurodivergent perspectives, and then also like testing using, say, screen readers to make sure that my interfaces were understandable to kind of as many people as possible. So I guess it is to even just like sending it out to all ages. So I, I mean, I guess it is really just about yeah. Um, it's been one of the projects that I've done more, has had more testing on a creative project. And I mean, I think it's probably, made, you definitely made the project better. Um, I don't, did that answer the question? I think it's the same as any other um, communication design project. I have, that, that's what I've experienced so far. Yeah. yeah. No, I think that answered perfectly. Uh, the question and again sort of like the media and then what's possible within the media will sort of like shape or define the range how accessible you can you can make it yeah yeah there's I mean like uh, in my and Miriam's book um, I mean we probably had more creative freedom um, I mean all of the type is legible some type is small for a reason. Um, you know, you might need a magnifying glass, but it's kind of because it's communicating data, it's like on a one to one scale, it's kind of meant to prove a point. Um, you know, yeah, I think it will just depend on the audience and it is so, so much about the context of it that will inform, like, yeah, what you can, how far you can go uh -huh. in making it super accessible. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, Steph, that wraps up our meetup today. Uh, again, um, from my side, also from um, Luke, who was still involved in the organization of this meetup, um, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I say this also sort of like uh, as a representative of the whole community, um, thanks to the attendees for joining us today. Um, it has been fascinating. Uh, it has been a long time coming until we had you on. Um, very happy that we get to do this. Um, for our attendees, uh, our next meetup uh, in July will likely be on the 29th of July, um, same time, same place. For now, we'll stay virtual. Um, and then we have uh, more planned for August and September uh, and reassess then if uh, local uh, sort of like in-person meetups might become possible again, sort of like towards Q4. But we will keep you posted. Uh, you will find the new meetups on meetup.com. Uh, in the meantime, if you have questions, reach out to us. If you'd like to follow up with Steph, you will find her. Stephanie, I give this back to you. Where would people be able to follow your work and maybe reach out to you? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you, stephaniepossvic.com is an out-of-date website. <laughs> um, or you can find me at Steph Poss, S-T-E-F-P-O-S on Twitter or Instagram for things that are marginally more up-to-date. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, all right, then we'll close for today. Thank you again, Stephanie. Thanks everybody for joining us today and uh, have a great rest of your day. Yeah, thanks everyone. And uh, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.